Hello, I'm Guillaume Fulquier. I'm uh, in the final year of my PhD at the University of Worcester, and I'm going to talk to you about the issue of sovereignty in the garden scene of Richard II. So Richard II is Shakespeare's most profound history play in terms of political thought, and this is linked to its use of the imagery of the land. Indeed, the word land appears more than 70 times, the word earth 29 times, and the word ground 12 times, which is more than in any other play. As its recent productions often demonstrate, images of the land form a root system at the basis of the play's conceptualization of politics. In the middle of the play, often the first scene after an intermission, the garden scene of Act 3, Scene 4 has a choric function. It's a time for reflection and commentary on the events that are unfolding. It begins with Richard's queen, Isabel, expecting unwelcome news of the political situation after we have seen Richard surrender to his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. As she seeks to drive away the heavy thought of care, her attending ladies suggest artistic forms of expression, song and dance, but Isabel finds herself unable to express anything but sadness. It seems that having serious worries is completely new to her carefree life, so it is quite a shock for her at that moment to hear the gardeners discuss the latest developments of distressing events that concern her more directly than themselves. The expression of that shock mobilizes no less than the biblical fall of mankind, after she has herself introduced the comparison by calling the gardener Thou, old Adam's likeness. She questions him on how he heard of Richard's demise. What eve, what serpent hath suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? She sees Richard's deposition as a calamity as profound as the very fall of mankind. These specific references to Adam and Eve, alongside the play's earlier reference to Eden, remind us of the founding myth of Christianity according to which God gave Adam and Eve dominion over all other beings. This inherently hierarchical relation seems to be the foundational element of Richard's conception of his kingship as sacred and untouchable, here shown to be shared with his queen. The queen goes on to curse the gardener who informed her of her husband's situation. The garden becomes, in Richard II, an intermediary metaphor which places itself in between the body natural, the king's human body, and the body politic, that is to say the king's sovereignty over the entire realm. In inserting itself at this intermediary, the garden questions the concept of the king's two bodies and challenges us to develop more material and more sovereign understandings of our bodies, our relation with nature, with each other and with the world. The most directly political words spoken by the gardener hold a deep ambiguity at their core in terms of hierarchy. Go thou and, like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays which look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. In a context of a play depicting the deposition of a king, the gardener's political vision could be interpreted as anti-hierarchical, but this ambiguity is lifted later. The image re even refers to a historical act of tyranny when the last king of Rome, Tarquinus, cut the heads of the tallest puppies in this garden to hint to his son Sextus that his next act of sovereign of Gabii should be to eliminate any prominent citizens of the city. Behind this question of political theory, the gardener's image reveals an understanding of nature and of his place in it. It focuses on the visible part of the plant, ignoring the deep invisible networks of roots and thus reveals a conception of the garden where the visible is valued over the invisible, and human enjoyment is prioritized over the well-being of the garden's life. It also reflects a misguided understanding of the supposed hierarchies in nature, as if it was heavily defined by competition for survival rather than symbiotic cooperation. Finally, the gardener remains sovereign. He places himself above the plants, reflecting the natural order ideology that Shakespeare uses in representations of chaos, for instance, in the context of regicide in Macbeth and Julius Caesar. In parallel with the fruit harvest, the priorities suggested by the gardener's instructions are focused on beauty. The aesthetic principles followed in the task of cutting the tallest branches are based on a symmetrical vision of natural beauty, when the visual designs observed in plants often follow fractal patterns. Symmetry is simpler to understand and control, and therefore it is preferred and imposed while more spontaneous patterns are unappreciated and removed because they are perceived as more chaotic. 
the conception of the world's natural order becomes the founding assumption and guiding principle of the gardener's duties. In permaculture, however, farmers and gardeners adopt a clearer understanding of spontaneous patterns and work alongside them rather than against them, creating spaces that feel rather than simply look pleasant and comfortable, with less maintenance work and a thriving biodiversity, as well as a more stable future. The implications of the gardener's vision in terms of political theory point to what could be called an entire ideology of gardening. In this case, the starting point of my definition of ideology is the Aristotelian conception of matter as receiving form from ideas. In my view, ideology is simultaneously material and cognitive, and it conceives the bodies and minds of humans as the battlegrounds of conflicting worldviews, which seek to appropriate the meaning of the material reality in order to secure positions of power through influence and control. In a microscopic scale, this applies to gardens as idealized spaces where humans shape natural elements for their enjoyment according to simpler designs than natural ones. The gardener's man questions the relevance of his work in the absence of a leading example at the scale of the realm and its government. Why should we keep law and form in due proportion? When our sea-walled garden, the whole land is full of weeds. Her fairest flowers choked up, her fruit trees all upturned, her hedges ruined and knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. His words point out the artificial dimension of both the garden and the state. The scene's two uses of the verb dress indicate this too. And this question is followed by a list of consequences expected when a garden is gravely neglected. As the imagery of gardening develops into an explicit metaphor for governance, it builds a contrast between Richard's failure and Bolingbroke's determination, which conveys the shift in perception of legitimacy from the king to his banished cousin. The gardener and his two men discuss state affairs and the king's duties, formulating a lesson of governance through their own duties in the garden. The gardener uses his responsibilities as images involving the control of growth to describe the monarch's need to guarantee the stability of his realm. We, at time of year, do wound the bark, the skin of our fruit trees, lest being overproud with sap and blood, with too much riches it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear and he to taste their fruits of duty. Richard's failure is attributed to his inability to control or resist the influence of his favourites, whom Bolingbroke targeted as soon as he returned from exile. But we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Baggart and their accomplices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. The image of the caterpillars returns in the garden scene in an indirect reference to the king's favourites and represents Bolingbroke tending the garden, which constructs his legitimacy as a potential ruler. But it is a more literal image of violence, which is used to figure the first sovereign act of Bolingbroke. The gardener's instruction to cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays refers ironically to Bushy and Green, the king's favourites, whose heads were cut at the beginning of Act Three. While Bolingbroke builds a material relation with the land to give his claim more legitimacy, Richard upholds a symbolic relation with the land, as long as he holds power. Nonetheless, when he is deposed, he begins to conceive of the land in a more material way. This marks the beginning of his journey to redemption and calls for our empathy and forgiveness. This aspect of the play is best approached through a material ecofeminist lens around the concept of a joint materiality of the human body and the natural world. These relations are strongly embodied, that is to say materialized in their very bodies, in ways which represent their conception of politics and of their own place in the world. They reflect the transition from Richard's sacred kingship to Bolingbroke's real politic, and thus their personal conceptions of sovereign power. The strength of the representation of these relations with the land also explains why soil has become a recurring element in performance. In Joe Hill Gibbon's abstract production, Richard replaced his queen in a garden scene and was covered in soil and water. This represented his return to a material understanding of the land and the destruction of his kingship as he is symbolically composted. Late in the same production, Richard encountered the physicality of his land in a less violent way. Small amounts of soil and water were carefully placed on his head in a baptism-like ritual representing his final communion with the land and the humbling materiality of itself. 